Can you explain to Canadians watching, Minister, why it was okay to pause the price on carbon for home heating oil, but not for this upcoming increase as of April 1st? So uh, the, the very reason for putting a price on pollution, and, and it's been done before, and not just for climate change, but for, their in, uh, for other environmental challenges, is that you want to incentivize change in behavior for companies, industrial uh, organizations, but also individuals. What we found out with home heating oil is that um, most, majority, the vast majority, in fact, of people who, who are still using home heating oil in Canada, and there are more people in my home province of Quebec than in all of Atlantic Canada, for example, that still use it, but uh, tend to be low, uh, lower uh, to middle income uh, Canadians who don't have the money to make the switch for less polluting form of home heating oil, uh, home, home heating, uh, which is why we decided to put a pause specifically on this, because home heating oil is the most expensive, it's the most inefficient, and it's the most polluting way of heating your home. And I do take your point, Minister, that uh, as far as volume goes, there are more of those homes outside of Atlantic Canada, but as a portion of the types of heating that's used, it's far greater in Atlantic Canada than it is in other uh, parts of the country. And the, the Atlantic MP surrounding the Prime Minister when he made that announcement, I think, speaks to that fact. But at this point in time, given the affordability struggles, like you highlight many of those using home heating oil are facing, would it not be worth considering pressing pause in this instance? No, no, it wouldn't, because we can't put a pause on, on, on climate change. And, and, and what Pierre Proliev never talks about is the fact that people right now, 8 out of 10 Canadians, families, get more money back than they pay. In, in Welcome back to Canada Wide. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. And Stephen Gilbeau here, he's in a winter coat. Ooh, it must be freezing outside. How come it looks like there's not a stitch of, stitch of snow in the back? There's no fog coming out of his mouth. Is this part of the joke that he's doing, that it's just a big facade? And him saying that Pierre doesn't talk about the 8 out of 10 Canadians. If it was that, why is everyone showing facts from the same document to saying that what he is bringing up all the time is false? It is fake. He just, you know, say it loud, say it often, and they would totally buy it. You remember who said that? His predecessor. Let's continue with this interview. In, in, in carbon pricing. So the, the, the richest among us don't. The, the, the people who pollute the, the, the most, but eight out of 10 uh, Canadian families. And, and, and that has been confirmed by the parliamentary budget officer. So e if we were to do that, we would actually hurt people economically while they're struggling. It, it wouldn't help them at all. So let's just unpack that statement for a moment, because when the parliamentary budget officer considered the in and out, exactly what you're referring to, uh, he did determine that when you take just the direct uh, you know, input of the carbon tax and the value of the rebate, more Canadians are better off. But when you add on the economic impact, so for example, the impact on investment income and overall on economic growth, slightly more Canadians, he determined, were worse off. Add to that, Minister, the fact that you have about $2.5 billion, only $100 million of which has been allocated that was supposed to be set aside for those who are disproportionately impacted by the carbon price, so farmers, small business owners, and Indigenous people, and you have yet all these years in to disperse that money. Is it fair to truly say more Canadians are better off? Absolutely, it is. Um, the parliamentary budget officer, uh, and, uh, and he, did, he did some interviews this week, is, is the first one to recognize that this analysis is a partial analysis. It doesn't take in into account the economic benefits of, of growing renewable and clean tech industry and, and the investments that we're doing in, in electrification of transportation, which will have very beneficial economic impacts to Canadians. It will come over time in the coming in the coming years. The parliamentary budget officer is the first one to recognize that his analysis doesn't take into consideration the cost to Canadians of climate change. And in, in terms of farmers, we've returned more than one billion dollars uh, of uh, federal investment to help farmers reduce their their carbon footprint, to reduce their pollution in the last two years. We, we, there, there is a portion of the money that we still have to return for, for small and medium-sized businesses and to Indigenous communities, and we're working to do that, and, and this, will, this will happen in the coming months. But with respect, Minister, that money has been set aside since 2019. Those small businesses are telling your government and us frequently how difficult things are for them at the moment. It's not nothing. It's 10% it's of what you've taken in through 
the carbon tax. And so far, you've dispersed just $100 million of that. So a, a, couple, of, a, a couple of things. I mean, we, we lowered taxes for small and medium-sized businesses. So we have been there for them. We supported them through the pandemic, through billions of dollars of federal support. 80% of the money that was spent during the pandemic to help Canadians, to help businesses, and especially small and medium-sized businesses, came from the federal government. In terms of, uh, of the carbon, carbon pricing, we are in the process of, of returning uh, that money. We haven't, we haven't been sitting on $2 billion since 2019. The program was put in place in 2019. This money has accumulated over, over, over time, and, and we will be returning it to them, as we promised to do, as I said, in the coming months. And then I just wanted to look ahead, if you could, for a moment, Minister, to what the future looks like, because you know that this will form a big part of the political debate going forward and heading into the next election. Right now, the plan, plan rather, that your government laid mm -hmm. out post-2019 uh, the 2019 election got us to 2030 and the targets that, that you've set out to 2030 and that is when the price on carbon will reach 170 dollars a ton uh, do you intend for that price to continue to go up since you do see this as such an integral part of your climate policy beyond 2030 to help canada reach its 2050 target so we haven't made a decision on that uh, we've started consultation to prepare the next phase of emission reduction so post 2030 uh, in canada in fact going to, to 2035 those consultations are are, are ongoing um, we canada will need to make a determination by next year as per our united nations commitment to to, to set those those new targets for, for 2035 uh, we will need to do that by, by next year, by, by 2025. There's no decision that has, been, that has been made yet, other than we will continue increasing the price on pollution. But also, for people who are watching us, we will continue increasing the rebate so that 8 of 10 Canadians can continue receiving more than what they pay. But no decision has been made as to what would happen after 2030. You have a Once again, we go back to the same document, 8 out of 10, and I've made this video as well. That is false what he is saying. He is not looking at the full economic impact. He is looking at a partial percent of it, a partial number. He is not looking at the big picture, and it's on the report, but he ignores to look at it because it doesn't fit his narrative. The more he can lie and drag it on is all his aim is. And I checked. It was five degrees in that location where he was at. So, you know, this is just fake. I don't know, he could have had a light spring jacket on too, but you know, it's all part of the image that he puts on. Let's continue. A lot of experience in this field, and I'm wondering from where you sit at this point, if you think, given the arguments your government has put forth, that the consumer side of the price on carbon, which uh, the Climate Institute this week said was accounting for eight to nine percent of reductions in emissions by 2030, or projected to by 2030, if you believe it to be a key ingredient beyond 2030. Uh, as you pointed out, Vashi, I've been doing this for, for, for some time. I've been looking at climate change measures, policies, programs for the better part of my adult life, really, the last 30 years. And if there's a measure somewhere that someone can find, can point to me, that will help us to achieve at least 10%, if you were talking about the fuel charge, of our 2030 targets at, at no extra cost to consumers. It's revenue neutral. Whatever we, 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 we collect, we send back. If there's a measure like that lying around under a rock somewhere, I, I, someone needs to show it to me because, because I, I, I haven't seen it. Is that certainly the case, though, especially when you take into account what the Climate Institute pointed out this week, that the, cons the industrial side of the carbon price is three times as effective? Could you not strengthen measures on that side? Uh, and just to, to, to sort of add to that, I know that you're, you're you know, talking about Pierre Polyev, but, but he isn't the only, and I understand your criticisms there, but, but he isn't the only politician saying a consumer price on carbon isn't necessary. Many of your progressive allies, like Premier Wab Kanu, like the leader of the Alberta NDP, Rachel Notley, like liberal Bonnie Crombie, like liberal Andrew Fury, all of them are saying the same thing as Pierre Polyev in this instance. Um, fighting climate change is hard. And, and the easy thing to do would be to, 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 to cave in and say, okay, we, we won't do that. But, but if we don't continue putting in place measures to fight climate change, then it means more Canadians being impacted by, by heat waves. By, I mean, how many tens of thousands of Canadians had to be evacuated across the country last year? Sometimes once, twice, three times because of the forest fires. Nova Scotia, worst forest fires in the history of the country, worst droughts in the history of, of, of the country, worst tropical storm in the history of, of the country. And 
And, and those provincial politicians who say we shouldn't be doing that haven't come up with any measures to say how we will fight climate change. They have, th they have no plan that shows how we get to meet our 2030 targets and contribute to the international efforts. Of course, so, Canada so won't Premier solve climate Fury change on its own, but, but no one can do. So Premier Fury has no plan. That's your contention because he would contend otherwise. He doesn't have a plan that shows how we get to 2030. And, and, and if someone comes to tell me you shouldn't be doing this measure, mm -hmm. then, then they have the responsibility to tell me and Canadians how we get there because otherwise it's just caving into political pressure. And yes, it's tough politically, but, but, but it's not because it's tough that, that we shouldn't be doing it. In fact, quite the opposite. We have a, re a moral responsibility to Canadians, to our kids and grandkids, to ensure that we do everything we can to fight climate change and, and doing it at a cost that is, that is reasonable. And, and pricing is one of the most efficient way of doing that. Doing it otherwise would mean more taxpayers' dollars on the hook for that. Minister, I'll leave it on that note. I appreciate your time very much today. Thank you. Thank you very much. 1.5% of greenhouse emissions come from Canada. Him doing his tax is just a deterrent. And the, the, they, someone mentioned too, tax is not supposed to be there to deter people from not doing something. And people have to go buy groceries. They have to eat. They have to drive their kids. They got to drive to work to pay money. He doesn't give a crap about any of that. He is a radical leftist. If he was, well, when, when he's young, he climbed the CN Tower, but if he was young now, it would be someone throwing tomato paste, tomato paste or a pizza on a work of art. That's how they get it. Or they did do something to the dinosaur bones in the, live, in the uh, museum. That's what a kind of radical that he would do now. This guy is so out of touch. The facts are there. He's not listening to it. If he can't see facts on a PDF piece of paper that everyone is referencing, then how can this guy predict anything, even tomorrow, what's going on, going on, yet alone, in a year from now, or five years, or ten years, if he won't even look at the facts in front of him right now? Isn't that so sad with this guy? I, I can't believe that we're still talking about this, The eight out of ten people get more money back. That is so false. He doesn't care about facts. It is so sad. Anyway, let me know in the comments what you think of Stephen Gilbo, and it's sort of typical what he does.